on untackling climate change. Thank okay, you. that's kind of brought us up to date with the journey that we've been on the last 12 months. Let's look uh, right where we are at COP in Egypt right now and what is coming out of that with our second question of the night, which comes from Ella Skinner. Ella, on you go. Um, is financial compensation from richer to poorer countries a feasible and acceptable option to undertake? Thank you. Uh, Marion McCallan, you already touched on this, and Nicola Sturgeon went there with this, this pledge, £7 million, I think. We've already had a raft of cutbacks announced by Scottish Government in recent weeks. Where's that money coming from? It's coming from our Climate Justice Fund, which at COP26 last year we committed to treble. We introduced it in 2012. It was a world first then. We committed to treble it, and we are now committing funds, loss and damage funds. And Rishi um, Sunak has said that. tonight the UK government will not be following you on this journey. Well, it sounds like we've still got work to do with Rishi Sunak then on, and on this, as in with a number of matters. But we, we think it is really important. We think there are two great intolerable ironies at the heart of the climate crisis. Firstly, that those who are suffering first and worst now, everything up to including loss of culture, uh, loss of education, loss of life. These people have done virtually nothing to cause climate change and we as Global North countries have benefited. We have been enriched by the industrial processes that have caused it. The other great irony is that these same people, people in the Global South, young people, women, they are far too infrequently heard. Uh, we heard that you know, COP is imperfect. I, I absolutely agree with that assessment. And one of the things that makes it imperfect is that I look along that line of world leaders and I see far too few women and I see far too few uh, younger people. But on the, the point about loss and damage, I think it's absolutely right. Um, climate change is an urgent human rights issue. It is right that we talk about it in the future, but it is happening right now. Do you and, think and this, this conversation is very I mean, much sorry, about just, that. Let me just ask a question. Do you think this conversation would be different if women were taking more of a lead on it? Yes, and I think we would be having it decades ago. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree entirely with that. And, um, you know, there, we've, we're already experiencing trillions of dollars of uh, loss and damage around the world. And the people who are worst hit, as Mary just said, are the um, people in the poorest countries. And um, not only do they need um, money for loss and damage, they also need money for adaptation, which has been extremely slow and inadequate to arrive and is finally being um, separated from um, loss and damage money because these are so interconnected. The more that you adapt um, to these extreme conditions, you adapt your infrastructure, you adapt your agriculture to those conditions, the less likely you are to risk losing these, losing life, losing um, food harvest, losing a bridge that washes away in a flood in Pakistan. And help us understand, this, this is what your book's about, are. help us understand the consequences. Yeah, so, if we don't do this, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, so, so my book is about this issue that some people, large numbers of people in large swathes of the world in the tropics over the coming decades are not going to be able to adapt to these extreme temperatures. They're going to have to move. And one of the adaptations we're going to have to look at and we're going to have to discuss and which is not on the table at all at COP27, is climate migration. And, you know, people are going to have to move, and it's a devastating situation. Millions? Billions? Tens of millions already, um, hundreds of millions, very likely. Some estimates are one and a half billion by uh, 2050. And places of relative safety in the Northern Hemisphere, like Scotland, are going to be hosting these people. How are we going to do it? What sort of cities are we going to build? What sort of inclusive cities um, that are adapted, that are sustainable, that are green, that are productive for these new enlarged citizens? How are we going to make sure that we, as a global population, thrive through these terrifying times that we're facing? Mm. Let me just 